I'm going to read to you from the book, The Tao of Seneca, Volume 1, uh, which is a collection of the letters of the work of Lucius Annaeus Seneca the Younger, from the fourth, born in somewhere around the fourth century BC, died around AD 65. His letters are collected in the three volumes of the Tao of Seneca as a kind of modern self-help group, group <laughs> self-help book. Uh, and this is letter four on the terrors of death. It's a letter to his friend, a younger friend, I believe, Lucilius. Keep on as you've begun, and make all possible haste, so that you may have longer enjoyment of an improved mind, and one that is at peace with itself. Doubtless you will derive enjoyment during the time when you are improving your mind, and setting it at peace with itself. But quite different is the pleasure which comes from contemplation when one's mind is so cleansed from every stain that it shines. You remember, of course, what joy you felt when you had laid aside the garments of boyhood and donned the man's toga and were ex escorted to the forum. Nevertheless, you may look for a still greater joy when you have laid aside the mind of boyhood and when wisdom has enrolled you amongst other men. For it's not boyhood that still stays with us, but something worse, boyishness. And this condition is all the more serious because we possess the authority of old age together with the follies of boyhood, yea, even the follies of in infancy. Boys fear trifles, children fear shadows, we fear both. All you need to do is to advance your will, thus understand that some things are less to be dreaded precisely because they inspire us with great fear. No evil is great, which is the last evil of all. Death arrives. It would be a thing to dread if it could remain with you, but death must either not come at all, or else must come and pass away. It's difficult, however, you say, to bring the mind to a point where it can scorn life. But do you not see what trifling reasons impel men to scorn, to scorn life? One hangs himself before the door of his mistress. Another hurls himself from the housetop, that he no longer be compelled to bear the taunts of a bad-tempered master. A third, to be saved from arrest after running away, drives a sword into his vitals. Do you not suppose that virtue will be as efficacious as excessive fear? No man can have a peaceful life who thinks too much about lengthening it, lengthening it or believes that living through many consulships is a great blessing. Rehearse this thought every day that you may be able to depart from life contentedly. For many men clutch and cling to life, even as, as those who are carried down a rushing stream clutch and cling to briars and sharp rocks. Most men ebb and flow in wretchedness between the fear of death and the hardships of life. They are unwilling to live, yet they do not know how to die. For this reason, Make life as wholly agreeable to yourself by banishing all worry about it. No good thing renders its, renders, it, renders its possessor happy, unless his mind is reconciled to the possibility of loss. Nothing, however, is lost with less discomfort than that which, when lost, cannot be missed. Therefore, encourage and toughen your spirit against the mishaps that afflict even the most powerful. For example, the fate of Pompey was settled by a boy and a eunuch, that of Crassus by a cruel and insolent Parthian. Gaius Caesar ordered Lepidus to bare his neck for the acts of the tribune, Dexter, and he himself offered his own throat to Cynea. No man has ever been so far advanced by fortune that she did not threaten him so as greatly as, he had previously, as she had previously indulged him. Do not trust her seeming calm. In a moment the sea is moved to its depths. 
the very day the ships have made a brave show in the games, they are engulfed. Reflect that a highwayman or an enemy may cut your throat, and though he is not your master, every slave wields the power of life and death over you. Therefore I declare to you, he is lord of your life that scorns his own. Think of those who have perished through the plots in their own house and their own home, slain either openly or by guile. You will that just as many who have been killed by angry slaves as by angry kills, as by angry kings. What matter, therefore, how powerful he be whom you fear, when every one possesses the power which inspires your fear? But, you will say, if you should chance to fall into the hands of the enemy, the conqueror, conqueror will command that you be led away. Yes, whither you are already being led. Why do you voluntarily deceive yourself and require to be told now for the first time what fate it is that you've long been laboring under? Take my word for it. Since you were born, you are being led thither. We must ponder this thought and thoughts of the like nature. If we desire to be calm as we await that last hour, the fear of which makes all previous hours uneasy. But I must end my letter. Let me share with you the saying which pleased me today. It too is culled from another man's garden. Poverty brought, poverty brought into conformity with the law of nature is great wealth. Do you know what limits that law of nature ordains for us? Merely to avert hunger, thirst and cold. In order to banish hunger and thirst, it is not necessary for you to pay court at the doors of the purse proud, or to submit to the stern frown or to the kindness that humiliates. Nor is it necessary for you to scour the seas or go campaigning. Nature's needs are easily provided and ready to hand. It is the superfluous things which men sweat, the superfluous things that wear our togas threadbare, that force us to grow old in camp, that dash us upon foreign shores. That which is enough is already to our hands. He was he who has made a fair compact with poverty is rich. Farewell. And now Seneca on sharing knowledge. I feel, my dear Lucilius, that I am being not only reformed but transformed. I do not yet, however, assure myself or indulge the hope that there are no elements left in me which need to be changed. Of course, there are many that should be made more compact or made thinner or be brought into greater prominence. And indeed, this very fact is proof that my spirit is altered into something better, that I can see its own faults of which it has previously been ignorant. In certain cases, sick men are congratulated because they themselves have perceived that they are sick. I therefore wish to impart to you this sudden change in myself. I should then begin to place a surer trust in our friendship, the true friendship which hope and fear and self-interest cannot sever, the friendship in which and for the sake of which men meet death. I can show you many who have lacked, not a friend, but a friendship. This, however, cannot possibly happen when souls are drawn together by identical inclinations into an alliance of honourable desires. And why can it not happen? Because in such cases, men know that they have all things in common, especially their troubles. You can't conceive what distinct progress I notice that each day brings to me. And when you say, Give me also a share in these gifts which you have found so helpful. I reply that I am anxious to heap all these privileges upon you, and I am glad to learn in order that I may teach. Nothing will ever please me, no matter how excellent or beneficial, if I must retain the knowledge of it to myself. And if wisdom were given me under the express condition that it must be kept hidden, not uttered, I should refuse it. No good thing is pleasant to possess without friends to share it. I shall therefore send to you the actual books 
And in order that you may not waste time in searching here and there for profitable topics, I shall mark certain passages, so you can turn at once to those which I approve and admire. Of course, however, the living voice and the intimacy of a common life will help you more than the written word. You must go to the scene of action first, because men put more faith in their eyes than in their ears, and second, because the way is long if one follows precepts, but short and helpful if one follows patterns. Cleanthes could not have been the express image of Zeno if he had merely heard his lectures. He shared in his life, so into his hidden purposes, and watched him to see whether he lived according to his own rules. Plato, Aristotle, and the whole throng of sages who are destined to go each his different way, derived more benefit from the character than from the words of Socrates. It was not the classroom of Epicurus, but living together under the same roof, that made great men of Metrodorus, Elamarchus, and Polyamus. Therefore I summon you, not merely that you may derive benefit, but that you may confer benefit, for we can assist each other greatly. Meanwhile, I owe you my little daily contributions. You shall be told what pleased me today in the writings of Hecate Hall. It is these words. What progress, you ask, have I made? I have begun to be a friend to myself. That was indeed a great benefit. Such a person can never be alone. You may be sure that such a man is a friend to all mankind. Farewell. And lastly, this is Seneca's letter to Lucilius on old age. Wherever I turn, I see evidences of my advancing years. I visited lately my country place and protested against the money which was spent on the tumble-down building. My bailiff maintained that the floors were not due to his own carelessness. He was doing everything possible, but the house was old. This was the house which grew under my own hands. What has the future in store for me? if stones of my own age are already crumbling. I was angry, and I embraced the first opportunity to vent my spleen in the bailiff's presence. It's clear, I cried, that these plain trees are neglected. They have no leaves. Their branches are so gnarled and shriveled. The boles are so rough and unkempt. This would not happen if someone loosened the earth at their feet and watered them. The bailiff swore by my, by my protecting deity that he was doing everything possible and never relaxed his efforts. But those trees were old. Between you and me, I had planted those trees myself. I had seen them in their first leaf. And I turned to the door and asked, Who is that broken down dotard? You've done well to place him at the entrance, for he's outward bound. Where did he get him? What pleasure did he give you to take up for burial some other man's dead? But the slave said, Don't you know me, sir? I'm Felicio. He used to bring me little images. My father was Felicitus, the steward, and I am your pet slave. This man is clean crazy, I remarked. Has my pet slave become a little boy again? It's quite possible his teeth are just dropping out. I owe it to my country place that my old age became apparent, whithersoever I turned. Let us cherish and love old age, for it's full of pleasure if one knows how to use it. Fruits are most welcome when almost over. Youth is most charming at, at its close. The last drink delights the toper, the glass which sizes him and puts the finishing touch on his drunkenness. Each pleasure reserves to the end the greatest delights which it contains. Life is most delightful, delightful, for it's on the downward slope. It has not yet reached the abrupt decline. And I myself believe that the period which stands, so to speak, on the edge of the roof, possesses the pleasures of its own. Or else the very fact of our wanting pleasures has taken the place of the pleasures themselves. How com comforting it is to have tried one out one's appetites 
and then to have done with them. But, you say, it's a nuisance to be looking death in the face. Death, however, shall be looked in the face by young and old alike. We are not summoned according to our rating on the censor's list. Moreover, no one is so old that it would be improper for him to hope for another day of existence. And one's day, mind you, is a stage, is a stage on life's journey. Our span of life is divided into parts. It consists of large circles enclosing smaller. One circle embraces and bounds the rest. It reaches from birth to the last day of existence. The next circle limits the period of our young manhood. The third confines all of childhood in its circumference. Again, there is, in a class by itself, the year. It contains within itself all the divisions of time by the multiplication of which we get the total of life. The month is bounded by a narrow ring. The smallest circle of all is the day. But even the day has its beginning and its ending, its sunrise and its sunset. Hence Heraclitus, who obscures, whose obscure style gave him his surname, remarked, One day is equal to every day. Different persons have interpreted the saying in different ways. Some hold that days are equal in numbers of hours, and this is true, for if by day we mean twenty-four hours' time, all days must be equal, inasmuch as the night acquires what the day loses. But others maintain that one day is equal to all, other, all days through resemblance, because the very longest space of time possesses no element which cannot be found in a single day, namely light and darkness, and even to eternity day makes those alterations, more numerous, not different, when it is shorter and different again when it was longer. Hence, every day ought to be regulated as if it closed the series, as if it rounded out and completed our existence. Acuvius, who by long, long occupancy made Syria his own, used to hold a regular burial sacrifice in his own honor, honor with wine and the usual funeral feasting, and then would have himself carried from the dining room to his chamber, while eunuchs applauded and sang in Greek to a musical accompaniment. He has lived his life. He has lived his life. Thus, Bacubius had himself carried out to burial every day. Let us, however, do from a good motive what he used to do from a debased motive. Let us go to sleep with joy and gladness. Let us say, I have lived. The course which fortune set for me is finished. And if God is pleased to add another day, we should welcome it with glad hearts. That man is happiest and is secure in his own possession of himself who can await tomorrow without apprehension. When a man has said, I have lived, every morning he arises, he receives a bonus. But now I ought to close my letter. What, you say? Shall it come to me without any little offering? Be not afraid. It brings something. Nay, more than something, a great deal. For what is more noble than the following saying, of which I make this letter the bearer? It is wrong to live under constraint, but no man is constrained to live under constraint. Of course not. On all sides lie many short and simple paths to freedom, and let us thank God that no man can be kept in life. We must spurn the very constraints that hold us. Epicurus, you reply, uttered these words, uttered these words, what are you doing with another's property? Any truth I maintain is my own property, and I shall continue to keep quotations from Epicurus upon you, so that all persons who swear by the words of another and put a value upon the speaker and not upon the thing spoken may understand that the best ideas are common property. Farewell. <laughs>